Hi, guys. Oh, excellent. Audio. Fantastic. Um, hello. Welcome. Uh, I'm happy you've come and s to come and watch me talk about the Wild Interface. Uh, so who am I? Just before I get started in my little discussion about this whole thing, uh, my name is Devin Hunt. Uh, I build software and stuff that people use for a living. Um, but the weird thing is my background was actually in the physical world, in industrial design and architecture. So when I moved into building video games and web apps, and now I'm working on my first mobile app, um, I took a lot of those learnings that I learned from that very well-established industry and moved that into the software world. And there's a lot of cool parallels that I saw when I went between those two things. So hopefully today, what I want to do is sort of talk about some interesting stuff that I've found to be a very useful set of guidelines and heuristics that when I start to build a novel interface or something new that people have to use, how I can start to embed learnings into those interfaces so I don't have to sit down, slap them around, and say, this is how you do it, obviously, but more so the interface can speak to them. So I want to go over first, just sort of set a foundation, talk about what the interface actually is. Like, what is this thing we build? Um, I then want to go into one of those old school design uh, principles, form follows function. And then I'm going to start going into this idea of a narrative interface and how animation is like our friend when it comes to building new things. So before I move on, like how many of you guys build stuff for other people? Like how many people actually do things that other people have to use? Almost everyone. Great. So this hopefully we can have a dialogue about this. Um, and since there's not that many, if there's any point where you want me to maybe clarify or you want to refute a claim or just need some more clarification, uh, do interrupt me, ask me, because this is more so to have a dialogue with you guys rather than me just be up here and talk about how awesome my ideas are. So let's get started. Let's dive right in. So what is an interface? I mean, if we look at sort of the classical definition, an interface is a place where two independent systems meet and communicate, right? And this is something I think we forget, because when we talk about interfaces in the popular culture, what we're really talking about is like, oh yeah, the UI is so cool, great interface. Or I'm playing a video game, like, wow, look at that awesome interface. Or I'm in the subway, and I'm using the new touch screens to order a sandwich. I'm like, what a great interface. But really, when we talk about interfaces, what we're talking about is how we get two completely independent systems to talk at a common point. So when we're thinking about building something, we got to think about how we make these two things work. And for a lot of the stuff that we're doing, what we're really talking about is how a human is talking to crazy machine code somewhere in the internet cloud. And if we keep this in mind throughout all the work we're doing, it starts to become very clear that we don't need to think about so much um, about what we need the UI to look like, but we have to think about how the UI communicates to the human more so than communicates to the computer. And this is something that we have to be very mindful about nowadays, because we're entering this world of what I sort of call consistent inconsistencies, which is a good thing. Like if we think about where we were five years ago, as people who build software or build stuff on computers, we really only have two devices to worry about. We had the home computer slash business computer, or we had the mobile connected object. That's it, right? That was like 2006 in a nutshell. But now we think about the realm of possibilities as designers, what we can create, it's getting really crazy. Like, what, five years ago, we had the Connect introduced. Just a year ago, we had the Leap Motion reduced. This introduced a whole new realm of physical interaction with hardware systems, right? No longer do we use keyboards and touches. We can now use motions and full body mapping. Um, and then receiving, like we have new ways to receive data. So the Oculus Rift provides home VR systems that we saw back in the 80s in science fiction films. We now have that. And then Google Glass provides a whole new layer of both inputs and outputs. Not only does it know where you are and what you're doing, it can feed you back information to help you do it better. Right? So the heuristics we use to design stuff is changing quickly. But this is awesome. Like We went from this crazy time in the 80s where everyone was inventing new stuff thanks to hardware. And then we sort of figured out in the 90s and mid-2000s that we kind of found a good medium point for all this stuff. The touch screens gave us nice physical contact. The computers gave us good processing contact. But now we're branching back out with the thanks the help of new ideas and stuff funded by Kickstarter was a bad idea, but they have to make it a good idea now. This is where we're at. But the problem with novel interfaces is that they're novel, right? So as people who are building stuff to run in these systems, we have to invent and think of ways to get people on board with us. Because when you gave someone a classic desktop app on, say, like Windows 95, a lot of the language existed. They knew they could click the Save button to save. They knew that they, if they minimized a window, it disappear. That was language that any application developer could build on. And now that we're entering this new realm, we have to think about how we embed education into our interfaces so it's not 
this sort of crazy system where they sit them down and do eight hours of education before they can be proficient. It has to become this natural exploratory motion. We have to allow the interfaces to teach people eloquently, is basically where I'm getting at. And so how can we do this? Well, we can borrow a lot of this information back from the nice Bauhausian era of industrial and architectural design, where we talk about form following function. This is a principle that I really try to hold on to in everything I try to build, because it forces me to be a better designer. So what do I mean by this? Well, form follows function is the basic idea that an object's shape and size should exhibit its purpose, right? The reason a couch is shaped this way is because it matches the human form, right? Imagine a couch eight times that size. I'd probably use it as a bed instead of a couch. So we have to think about how these objects explain what they do. For example, does anyone know what this is? It's called a banana guard. It's a case to hold your banana in your lunchbox. Like, you wouldn't try to put an apple in that, right? It's, it looks like a banana. It's shaped like a banana. You probably want to stick a banana or maybe a sausage in it. I don't know. You could do both. This guy got a lot right, and this is why we keep hearing his name all the time. For those uninitiated in, like, the cult of Apple, Dieter Rams was an industrial designer back from the 1950s who was part of Brom Home Appliances team. And he invented a lot of the design that we see in kitchens today, we see in offices today. His big thing is that good design was as little design as possible. And what this means is the minute you go past trying to just build the mere functionality and you get into ornamentation, you're now detracting from the actual useful object. This is one of his famous designs. You know, this is one of the first product lines he launched at Braun. Does anyone know what this is? This isn't a trick question. This is it's a clock radio. Like, it reads in English and in German. It's a clock radio. This was sort of like mind-blowing at the time. Everyone was like, well, why wouldn't you put them together and combine them in a clever way, in a big box? And he's like, because sometimes you want a clock and sometimes you want a radio. And there's both things. So it seems obvious when you see it now, but back then this was mind-blowing design. It was just like, wow, this is industrial design for domestic purposes. This enters into a big principle called performance versus preference. So this weird thing about humans is that we're fallible creatures. We're subjective. We're not very logical when it comes to our decisions. And it turns out that designs that are often optimum for us are the ones we don't prefer. We prefer designs that we are used to. And this is something that, as people who build stuff, we have to fight against this at all time. Here are two lemon squeezers. Has anyone ever seen one of these in the wild before, right? This is a classic piece of beautiful Art Deco industrial design. It is in design museums. Actually, if you go to the London Design Museum, you can see it. It's a great form to hold. Yes? Yeah. Uh, so industrial design is a term that I, I used to blanket for the design of human scale objects. So things that people use, yeah. So chairs, sofas, home appliances, printers. Um, it's sort of like a subset of architecture, not for the buildings, but the things that go in the buildings, if you will. So has anyone ever actually used one of these? Have you actually used it? What, what happened? Was it? It just went everywhere, right? Yeah, it's this weird thing that it looks awesome, but you have to like stick a bowl underneath it, and you got your lemon out, and you start squeezing it. And it, the idea is it seductively drips down the side and just pauses in the bowl. But we live in a world of actual laws, so lemon juice goes everywhere, and your shirt gets covered, and the bowl knocks over. And you go back out to your dinner guests, and they're like, what happened to you? So it's like, it's no good. This is the one we all use, right? So the funny thing is, is when we, there was a survey they did where they put both these objects in front of each other, and everyone preferred that because from an aesthetic sense, it's beautiful. But from a functional sense, this is the one we use. So we have to play to these biases when we think about designing stuff for people. One of my favorite examples of this is the QWERTY keyboard. So, Everyone recognizes the keyboard up top, right? That's the QWERTY keyboard. We use this daily. Now, hopefully, since we're at campus part and we have some hackers in the audience, does anyone recognize the keyboard on the bottom? Yeah, it's the Dvorak keyboard. So the history of the QWERTY keyboard is an interesting one. It came from a time when everyone still used mechanical typewriters, in like the 1860s. And mechanical typewriters are mechanical, so they're fallible. And the problem is, is as all these mechanical arms are slapping up against the paper, depositing ink, if you hit arms too quickly, they'll catch each other and jam. 
And so one of the designers at Remington sat down and designed a keyboard that forced people to always type the furthest letter apart so that they can type quickly but minimize the interaction of very close arms, right? So this keyboard was actually designed to, make, to force you to reach further on your keyboard, to keep your hands separate, which had the effect of slowing you down a bit. Now, with the advent of computers, when we add into electronic keyboards, right now, there's no speed limitation on these guys. We kept the QWERTY keyboard. Computers can do anything. There's no reason we even need a keyboard to do input to computers. We could have invented a whole new system for text input, but this is what everyone was used to. So when guys were sitting down to design the first computers, they went with an interface people were used to, which was the QWERTY keyboard. Right? They went with the preference. Now, the Dvorak keyboard was built to be faster and more efficient and more ergonomic. So this guy sat down and said, OK, the problem with QWERTY keyboards is we're always stretching our fingers, and you're getting these cramps, and you're getting tunnel, carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm going to build a keyboard so you never move your hands. And that's why the Dvorak keyboard is built with all the vowels in the home row and all the most often used consonants on the other hand. So you're still going back and forth between hands, but you rarely move your hand around so you can not only type faster, but it's more comfortable to type for longer periods. The, word, the world typing record has been set on a Dvorak keyboard, 228 words per minute. That's pretty fast. Uh, the QWERTY world record is like 150. So it's up there, but it's not nearly as quick. We need to keep this idea of what actually helps people move from like being novice to proficient in mind when we build these interface systems, right? This is a bit of a bastardization of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This came right from a very good book called The Universal Principles of Design. This is sort of the pyramid that we should be using to really check if we're building good stuff. Whoa. This is my talk. <laughs> the most important thing we need to think about when we build interfaces is, is it functional, right? This is sort of if we're making a hammer, it's like, can the hammer knock a nail in, right? Then we need to think about, is it repeatable, right? Is it reliable? Uh, can we knock in multiple nails in a row? Only then can we start to think about what is currently kind of the golden moment in design. Is it usable? That is, can I pick it up, and does it make sense that I can use this to hit in nails, right? That's usability. Now, the problem with a lot of modern interface design is we forget the top two tiers of this which is proficiency and creativity. These are the tiers where magic happens, right? Proficiency is, can I improve at hammering nails? Now that I got this nail hammering thing going, instead of doing it in 10 strikes, can I move up to just one strike, right? Can I be more faster at my job? More, that's terrible English. Quicker at my job. Creativity is where super magic happens. That's where it's like, I can use this hammer to open watermelons or like open this guy's house I want to get into, right? That's where like the next step moves. So creativity and proficiency often come from us developing very mature systems, but I think it's something we often forget to keep in mind, because that's where we can actually make some magic sparks happen with our users. Like, we want to help move these guys up through the system, right? So our job as interface designers is not just to make a cool experience, but it's to get people in the door and move them all the way through so they feel used and comfortable, and they come back for more, right? Our, no, so that thing I just said, our duty is to move people from naivety to creativity. That's sort of what we do as designers. And we do this because we have to teach them to tame the wild interface. So how do we do this? Well, there's lots of ways of doing this, right? We have tutorials, you have Stack Overflow, you have people who come into the office and teach you how to use it. Um, these are all very good methods, and some systems actually benefit more from this. But one of the things I've become very interested in, especially at university, and more so when I actually try to apply these principles to good design today, is this idea of the narrative interface. So this is kind of my own little term. I don't think anyone else uses this. But it's the idea that you sort of marry this idea of intuitiveness with explanation at the same time. So a narrative interface is any system that really affords discovery. right? It really allows people to play around with what's going on. So the idea is we want to educate the users as it uses it. You, know, you can kind of think of this as the interactive version of form and function. The more they poke, the more they learn about what's possible with what they do. Right? The whole trial and error thing. If you look at how children learn, they learn from mistake. Right? They put the electrical cord in their mouth and get electrocuted, and they probably won't do it again. Well, hopefully they do it again. I mean, hopefully they don't do it again. But the idea is that if you get people explore a bit more, and you actually let them self-actualize in the system, you'll get a lot more retention from them. And that's really good. There's one industry that totally gets this, and that's video games, right? So 
before I got into building web apps, I was doing lots of video game stuff. I love video games. Still play video games today, to my girlfriend's disbelief. Video games really understand this idea of playful discovery, right? Setting bounds that allow users to make mistakes, but allow them to learn from those mistakes. Let's take, for example, Super Mario. Has anyone not played Super Mario before I go on? Believe it or not, that's happened before, and it was weird. All right, so Super Mario. Super Mario is a genius piece of narrative interface. Before we like, so let me just set the stage. OK, Super Mario, we know Super Mario. But imagine you're not the person you are today. You understand how Super Mario works. You understand if you picked up a Nintendo controller, you would know what to do. But imagine you're that five-year-old boy, and like you go over to your cousin's house, and he, he has an NES. Like It just came out yesterday. Now, the problem is back then, there was no YouTube to Google how to play Super Mario, right? There was no, like, there's Nintendo Power, which is kind of, I guess, the YouTube of video games back then. But that's it. Like, the only way, the only thing you have is that controller and the screen. So how do you learn to play this game? Well, there's two things going for you. One, there's a big constraint. The controller only has six buttons. There's only so many things you can press. So thankfully, if you explore that, you won't go too bad. But how do you learn the rules of the game? How do you learn how to master this interface so you can progress through it? So it's quite a cool little system. So let's say like we press start. All right, so we're like, great, going to start the game. All right, so OK, what do we, oh, I can go left. All right, so I'm going right, going right. Oh, who's that dude? I love him. He looks great. Oh, that's bad. I died. OK, I don't want to touch him. Don't like that guy. OK, here we go again. I'm ready to go. All right, so let's walk. We're going to go try to find this Goomba. OK, oh, I can jump. This is great. What's going on, Goomba? And ha ha, I got you. Oh, shit, I can jump. That's interesting. I hit this thing. What's that? It's a splodgy Goomba. Do I like that? Oh, God, no. This level design here is so awesome. The fact that you can't escape that mushroom was built into the system. It wanted to teach you two things in those first five seconds of gameplay. One, you can die. That's good to know. Two, Goombas kill you, but you can jump over them. That's good to know. And three, mushrooms make you better. So just by playing that first little sequence of that game, you learn a lot about what this world is and how you can master it. Now, obviously, there's lots more you can do in Super Mario. There's firepower flowers, and there's castles and flags and all sorts of shit like that. But it gets you into the right mindset. This is a really cool use of a, of a narrative interface, right? The exploration allows you to move, but it also teaches you as you go through it. Imagine if we rebuilt that as a tutorial, right? Like you start the game and it like pop up. Did you know you can walk right? Oh, awesome. Okay, I'm walking right. It's like you get the Goomba pop up. Did you know you could jump over Goombas? Okay, I guess I'll jump. Like it's not the same sort of self actualization, right? It's not you discovering, it's you being told. And I think if we can all remember back to third grade in school, we don't really like being told. But when we're just doing stuff on our own right, that's a lot more fun. A quick aside, if you're interested in seeing this sort of system taken to like the ultimate extreme, do check out this game, A Dark Room. It's a browser game, so all you need is Chrome or just open it on your browser. It's at adarkroom.doublespeakgames.com. But this is an amazing game that really shows how exploration can be a really strong educational system. So. Do that. Like, it's fun. Do it when you get home, though, because you got stuck into it. And you five hours later, you're like, oh, crap. It's about chopping wood. I'll give a hint. It's fun chopping wood. Another example of this on the other side. So video games is one side. Let's go over to code. Let's go over to programming. Has anyone here ever used processing? Yeah. How awesome is processing? Five years ago, it was amazing. I haven't used it in a long time. But I love processing. I used to contribute to this. So processing, for those uninitiated, is a subset of Java that lets you do lots of creative programming very easily. So graphics, audio processing, all sorts of cool stuff like that. There's a lot of artists that use that to do interactive installations. Really cool tool. It looks something like this. It's a code window. So in this little area up here, you can type stuff, type code. But processing has something built into it that's very neat. It has a simple mode, and it has an advanced mode. There is no difference between the interface in either mode. So here's some code I typed into it. I said, make me a, a box 500 by 500, make it red, and draw a rectangle 100 by 100, or at location 100, 100 by 300. And that produces this, which is great. That's what I want. I want a red box. We're good to go. This is the exact same window with more advanced code. This is the exact same thing as this, and it produces the exact same thing but it is a more advanced version, it's a more proficient version. You have an animation loop going on there. 
And so while this is a bit of a reach, I'll give you that, it's that they give you the same sandbox to experiment with either the simple tutorials or the advanced tutorials, so you can grow into the interface. I thought it was a nice little thing. There is no other IDE that does this. Uh, and one of the reasons it does do this is because processing was built as an educational tool. So one of those cool little things. So narrative interfaces, like when we build them, what we're striving to do is to build these playful things, these sort of like sandboxes that it's safe to experiment in, but you get this feedback that gives you this learning. And more importantly, it gives you this visibility of system status. So when you die, it's obvious that you die. When you do something good, it's obvious you do something good. You want to reinforce the things that people should be doing and kind of downplay the things they shouldn't. This introduction to new possibilities really helps with that. It's basically about reaffirming the user's exploration, right? If we set up to build an interface that teaches as we go, then that's what we need to do. Just make sure they're always like, yeah, you're doing a good job. Keep going on. Or, hey, man, slow down. This relates back well to the 10 usability heuristics. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. It's a whole other talk. But basically, these are the 10 things that the Nielsen Group has sort of seen as what builds a good human-computer interaction. Right? And narrative interfaces are great at visibility system status. It's a great at matching the system in the real world. It's great at giving the user control and freedom. So it fulfills a lot of the aspects right away that you should be reaching for when building good stuff. And don't worry about writing this down. I'll put the slides up later, so if you want to get all that stuff. So I've yacked a lot about like, building these systems that talk to you, but how can we do it? Like, how do we actually do it? So one of the things I'm really passionate about is how animation can help you tell stories and get users on the same page in interfaces. Animation is an amazing tool. And we're lucky that in the modern world, it's becoming more and more accessible for designers. Right? Imagine building a complex animation in a web browser four years ago. It would involve a lot of JavaScript, maybe a bunch of plugins. You have, probably just have to go for Flash. Right? You got to use Flash. Nowadays, we can, with a few lines of CSS, accomplish so much more information delivery in one animation than what we could back then with a lot of system updates and status messages. Right? So it's about making this feedback ubiquitous. So I'm going to give you a puzzle. Here's three dots. What happened to these three dots? Between this and that, what happened? They moved to the other side. Well, what if I showed you this? Right? Here's those three dots again. They didn't move to the other side. They actually swapped places. Right? So just by showing the gradual change of state, we can get so much more information across in the same amount of time. But I think we all know this. This is nothing new. The reason this is important is this is how we can get this idea of the visibility of system status across to people much more easier, much more easily. Uh, a system should always keep users informed about what's going on through appropriate feedback within reasonable time. That's direct from Nielsen. It's a really important thing. Imagine how often you're frustrated when you're on YouTube and you load a video and you just get the magic spinner and it sits there for a while. Now, what's happened behind the scenes is the stream crashed on their server, and they just haven't alerted you about it. And so after about 15 seconds, you're like, reload, and it starts playing. And you're like, that sucked. Right? They kind of alerted you to it, but they didn't really show you what's going on. Right? So this is how you can get users to buy in quicker. Right? Make them feel like they're actually in control of what they're doing. Animation is such a good way to keep people informed on what's actually happening. Right? So let's go into examples of how we can do this. Animation is also great at helping people explore the interface they're now using, right? giving them good feedback. Um, how many people have used Subtle or read an article on Subtle, I should say, beforehand? Subtle is a blogging network. It's just a bunch of very good bloggers. They post their stuff, uh, nice middle interface. But it has some touches that I really think push it above some of the other platforms. This is a Subtle button. For those of you who have not seen this before, what do you think it does? No idea, right? So when I first saw it, I had no idea either. I saw it had 11 kudos next to it, but I was like, what? Like, what does that actually mean? So the cool thing, though, is when you move your mouse near it, you're like, oh, it grows. Whoa. And boom, it increases to 12. So this little playful button, they could have stuck a button there, but they sort of went above and beyond to make it a little playful interface. And the interface tells you what to do as you play with it. So you can actually toy with it, right? You can sort of play with it, because just a little bit of touching, and the animation really explains that something's about to happen. Something's changing and growing. So while it's a little gimmicky, I think it really speaks volumes of what a simple animation get across in a small space of time. Another great example of this 
is uh, OS X. I'm sure a lot of us have all used OS X. Um, I really want to point out the beauty of the subtle things that the Finder can do. Imagine you've never used a window manager before in your life, right? You're brand new. Like, you give this to your grandma, right? You're like, Grandma, have a laptop. She's like, great. What the hell do I do with this? Right? So she's playing around, and she has this box here. And so she's like, OK, I'm going to click this button. She clicks it, and it disappears. She's like, where did it go? The animation explained to the person where it went, right? So that one little state gave so much information of what happened to her system. Imagine that window just disappeared. I guarantee she would never find it, right? But because we showed what happened, that 100 millisecond animation of pulling the corner, we can find it instantly. So these little details are actually educational interfaces, right? It's not just a cool effect. It's telling the user where he can now find it. So this is a deliberate step that you have to sort of make when you start designing stuff. This is sort of a self-plug. Another example uh, where I've used a lot of these rules in practice is something I'm working on now called ColorDot. ColorDot is a, a scratch your own itch kind of project. I do a lot of my design work now in code. So having Photoshop open seems like overkill just to choose colors, right? That's like buying a house, just use the fridge, I feel. Like, it doesn't really, like, why would I do that? So I was tired of always opening Photoshop, waiting the 15 minutes for it to open, just so I could go find a nice blue. So I built this little app to do it. Um, it looks like this. This is what you get when you first load the app. Doesn't look like much, right? But you have this nice little um, part in the center here. So you're like, oh, I'll go move my mouse there. So the user grabs his mouse. Uh, and he swings to the screen. And the minute that mouse enters the screen, the whole thing changes. And as you start to swing your mouse back and forth, you start to notice the pattern to the mouse. You can explore, and you can quickly find a color you like. And when you click, the color peels off. So I'm showing the state change. I'm saying you've saved this thing. It's become part of this palette. Um, I'm going to be honest. This is kind of a mistake. Uh, when I built this, it was really just for myself. I didn't expect it to be anything that meaningful. Uh, and one of my friends posted on Hacker News, it got some followings, and I started to get amazing feedback for why people like this better than other color pickers. And it had a lot to do with the fact that it was exploratory. It wasn't about typing in numbers to get a color, it was about trying to find numbers, right? Find the colors. And, that, and what seems like a very small change made all the difference in the legibility of this interface. All of a sudden, it went from being like a weird technical object to something you could play with to discover things you need. So this is kind of what this does. Narrative interfaces give you these exploration sort of spaces to help users discover and learn as they go, right? They have their escape mechanisms. They have ways to pull back. So where does this kind of leave us? Um, I mean, throughout this talk, what I've been really trying to get into is that the language of interaction is always changing. And kind of our job is to always make sure that users can understand how to jump on, right? You're always going to have users that kind of get it from day one. But the people you should be worrying about is the ones you have to onboard in the first few steps and then get them up there with the rest of the guys who are proficient. That's kind of our job, right? And one of the ways that I found it to be really useful is if you use narrative interfaces and animations, you can do a lot just to get people past that point. And it's by being playful. It's by being a little quirky. It's sometimes maybe being gimmicky. But these gimmicks are what bring people back, right? It makes them feel welcome. It makes them feel happy that they're doing stuff. So that was my talk, actually. I did it in a whole half hour. Uh, so that's basically it. So I'm going to give you guys some recess so you can go off and, and like, enjoy the rest of the time. Uh, but since we have some time left, I'll be happy to take some questions and just see what's going on. Any questions, guys? Yeah. So you show Ooh, pro. Hey. Hello. Hey. Hey. So you show processing. And it was very interesting. Processing? The yeah, processing. And, yeah, processing, yeah. I wonder if you can suggest something similar if someone wants to learn web development. Oh, good question. Um, anything, really. Uh, web development is, is, is So web development is a tricky space, because web development is often used as a single term, but it really it's a bunch of different languages and systems all put together to produce a website. Um, there are some really cool resources out there to help you get kickstarted with this. Things like Code Academy and Treehouse are two, one's for profit, one's kind of free in a weird way, startups that build tutorials and interactive tutorials that help you teach web development. Um, I actually teach a course at General Assembly on kickstarting web development, which is quite fun. Um, but I think you think of anything that involves making, it's about just starting somewhere and trying to do it. Be that copying other projects just to get used to the syntax, or actually taking like formal tutorials to follow it. That's how you get in with it. Um, I think 
learning to code really react, reflects this idea of exploration. Right? You can do lots of stuff, and you'll get lots of errors, but you get feedback on why is an error, and you can go back and, and uh, figure out what's going on. Like getting error messages in a debugger window is kind of like a game. Right? It's like, you got an error. Here's a hint on where it is. And you're like, all right, got to go find this bug. And you go in there, and you're like looking around and typing stuff. And you break eight other things while trying to fix it. But uh, I mean, building and coding is very much a, a feedback loop between you and the computer system, which is quite cool. Um, so check out Treehouse. Check out um, Code Academy as starting points. Um, but one of the ways I learned to code was, so I learned to code because I want to make video games. So I started just like downloading open source games and trying to pull them apart to figure out how stuff happened. And then I went and got a CS degree. But that first part is where I all got started. And I think that's where you get that spark. Um, but I'm happy to point you some resources afterwards, if you want. Any other questions about education, I guess? <laughs> well, I'm glad that was so informative that everyone was just silent. Oh, yeah. So what do you do when your users look at your thing and they're like, they get the wrong idea about what it does and they want to do something else with it? Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, good question. So the question was, what happens when people start using your thing and they're doing the wrong stuff with it? So this is something that I call emergent behavior. And this is not a bad thing. This is actually a good thing. This is something you can embrace. So emergent behavior is when you've sort of built a system that allows people to get to that creativity stage where they can actually use it for different stuff that wasn't intended. Um, one of the classic examples of merchant behavior in modern day is uh, the retweet on Twitter, right? Twitter never designed the retweet. That was a community design thing. One day, people just started putting RT, person I follow, here's a message. They just tweeted that out because they thought it was cool, they wanted to share it. Um, and over time, Twitter was like, ah, that's a very interesting tool. We should embrace that emergent behavior. So Twitter was never meant to be about rebroadcasting other people, it was about broadcasting yourself. So first thing, A, if you can measure the fact that people are doing the wrong thing, uh, then you should look at whether or not you should be embracing that. Because maybe what you've explained as possible is not what you think is possible. right? So you've got to look at how you're actually relaying that information. And hopefully, you can embrace it. right? You don't want to let that go, because that might be the big win. Um, uh, what Second Life was really big at this. Right? Second Life was sort of built to be a big community space, open world, it was great. Um, but it turns out what it was, is it became a chat room for uh, niche subcultures. But they op like the Second Life guys are like, great, these guys are insane, but we love them because they love us, so let's build more features towards them. Uh, and like, when you first started Second Life, you had two avatar choices, like male, female. And now you have like male, female, vampire, furry. Like they just started adding on these options that people were trying to hack in themselves to get into the space. So it could be a good thing. It could be a sign that you're on the right track, but your users are now telling you what they really want to do. Or unless you have a very specific reason and they're doing it wrong, then that's a failure in the system, and you've got to patch that. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, from a behavior point of view, especially when like, users are using an interface that you've built, um, how do you resolve coming up against uh, like behaviors that, like for example, with Apple has taught us all these physical, mm. this physical vocabulary of swipe and tap and hold and pinch to zoom out and opposite pinch. What do you even call that? Yeah. <laughs> to, <laughs> to zoom in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, uh, how do you kind of, um, do, you do you work with those behaviors? Do you fight against them? Like I'm, I'm just curious uh, on so your this opinion is, this is a, that. This is really hits home right now because the app I'm working on on my iPhone is a translation of my color picker onto the iOS. And it turns out I break a bunch of the usability guidelines. Uh, not on purpose, it just turns out some of the things I thought were a good way to interact with the system don't match Apple's expectations. So the problem is, is when you buy into devices, like there are languages that devices have, right? When we walk up to an ATM, we kind of understand how to use a bank machine because every bank machine works in similar ways. This consistency is really important in building interfaces. So part of the things I really want to talk about, where am I going to find this? Uh, it's way back. But one of the things I've hopefully got across in this talk was that if you're going for a novel step, you have to get people to ease in that novel step. So you've got to move them from preference into performance. So the idea is you want to move them from what they're used to to what they're not used to. Oh, I know what it's going to make. Uh, this button is really interesting because it works every way you think it can work. If you click it, it just jumps to the end state. If you tap it on this touch screen, it just like, it feels really good. So one of the things that makes this beautiful, and I urge you to go to Subtle and just find some blog posts you like and just try it out, is it actually allows you to fall back on what you're used to, but at the same time shows you there's more to it. 
So this is sort of this explanation, right? Like you're, you're still being a safe sandbox where he can't really do anything wrong, but you try to nudge him back up to that next step of learning more about what can happen. Um, with a sense when it comes to physical hardware, like if you want to introduce that this means something different, it's like you have to think about how do we get people from understanding it means to expand to that it means that it separates things or it means that it rotates in, a so in some weird way. That's what we have to move with. Um, we went through this phase in web app developments maybe two years ago where interactive UIs became really popular in web apps. So we had like these one-page apps that did everything. And there's all these sort of constraints we had on desktop apps that didn't exist on the web. And we started cloning them. Things like sliders, things like calendar pickers and stuff. Some translated well, the calendar picker being a one. Um, some didn't translate well, like sliders and, and hooks didn't, don't feel the same on websites they do when they're in a little dialog box. And so we invented new systems to do that. Um, a great example is on the iPhone, you know the, the calendar picker thing? Like that was the better solution than having a big calendar. The funny thing is that's still called calendar picker. And that control on an iPhone renders those, those three wheels, you can slide up and down. But the same control on a desktop app renders the little date picker that we're used to. So what they did was they actually even, on the program level, said it's the same thing with different affordances. And that's what you have to do. But it's all experimentation. You just got to try to see what people actually fall down at and what they jump up at. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. All right, cool. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. OK. Uh, you said about uh, narrative interfaces, but sometimes it's uh, really annoying, like uh, introducing of a uh, new feature of Gmail, and uh, after new feature, uh, um, uh, the some pop-ups, uh, push Z button, Z button, Z button, uh, and uh, that narrative is uh, really annoying. Uh, well, what's the optimal uh, balance uh, uh, to learn uh, user new features of uh, uh, so, 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 some interfaces uh, is um, accepted. Good question. So the question is, like, how do we help users learn new stuff when we don't know how to like, inject it, right? It's like brand new. How do we get them engaged in that? Oops. Oh. How to learn uh, user new feature uh, with, 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 without uh, annoying alerts and so on? Well, the bizarre annoying pop-ups and things uh, like that. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. So really good question. Um, so once again, what I talked about in this talk was the narrative sort of structure of that. That is not to say that tutorials and stuff aren't good. They have their purpose. But I think they're very well-defined objects. I didn't want to bore you guys with talking about tutorials. Um, the question is, like, how does it work into what they currently have? Right? Because when someone has a workflow in your system, like they have a way they do stuff, how do you inject new objects so that, A, you don't break their original system, but also maybe help them become better with this new stuff. Um, video games are, once again, a really interesting place to look for this. Uh, everyone, I'm sure, has heard of Minecraft, the massive sandbox game. Um, like Every week, they introduce new stuff that it never broke the game the way you played it beforehand, but it made it harder to play it the old way. So you had to be sort of forced to adapt. Um, the answer is you could simply just chuck something in, put a big pop-up, and say, you can now do this if it's a productivity app, right? Because maybe it's more just making it aware of this is now a functionality. Or maybe a way you can do it is you introduction through an error thing. They're doing something they usually do, and then you say, hey, by the way, since you finished this now, you could also do the next step. This is like the new way. Introduce the new sort of step to it. Um, it's very case-by-case -case basis, right? Every, every system is going to have a different way of best trying to introduce this. Happy to chat afterwards. You have something particularly in mind to make it better. Uh, but it's like reduce the friction and make the user feel empowered by the new thing rather than as a, as a new clunky add-on that doesn't really help them. That's sort of the measure, I guess, is how I look at it. Hopefully that answered the question, <laughs> sort of. Any other questions, guys? All right, cool. Well, thank you. Oh, oh, more questions. I uh, wanted to ask, uh, basically, at what point do you know where you're actually crossing the line between too much interactivity and, you know, just being informative yeah. to the person? Good question. That's a very good question. Uh, I don't know. It's once again, I think, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever really seen too much interactivity. Do you have an example, maybe, of where that happened to you? Well, basically, some of the applications you can also sometimes see, like, in the interface, there was so much stuff there that oh, you don't know what to choose. Gotcha. Everything. So this is like the Photoshops, yes. right? Like, that's sort of classification. So I actually had Photoshop in here as a discussion point earlier, and I cut it because it was got a little bit boring. Photoshop's weird. Um, Photoshop, for though, like it's if you open Photoshop, 
there is no starting point, right? It is just a blank everything. It's not even a canvas open, right? You have to go file new to just get started. And when you put a file new, you get a dialog box that's like, how big do you want it? What color coding system do you want to use? Is it being printed? Is it CMYK? Is it RGB? What's going on? Are you using square pixels? Are you using NTSC pixels? You're like, whoa. And that's just to get a canvas open. But Photoshop's in a weird category, where Photoshop's a mature, established tool. Um, and there's so many entry points. And like, why are you even using it? Are you using it to do type design? Or are you using it to do photo editing? Or are you doing 3D CAD design and doing touch-ups to shadows? So Photoshop has this lucky spot where it's just the thing people use, so people are willing to go out and spend time to learn it. If you looked at Photoshop V1 way back in the day, it was a much simpler thing. It actually almost spoke to you and how to use it. It had like a canvas that opened when you opened it. And there was like four tools to use. One was a pencil, one was a brush, one was an eraser. And you're like, I know what those do. Right? It built on real world uh, consistencies. Nowadays, we're looking at something so mature and so built up, it's almost impossible to learn without tutorial. So you have to use tutorials in those systems. Um, it's interesting if you look at more native paint programs in contrast. So there's lots of new paint programs coming up that specialize in web design or specialize in pixel art for games. And they all have very specific affordances and narratives in their interfaces. Right? The pixel editor, oh, I cannot, I think it's called Pixel Mash. Um, when you open it, it actually starts with like, all the frames you need to make an animated sprite, and you can just start editing them. Oh, Prototypo is a great example of this. Prototypo is a uh, typography tool that's coming out soon, and it starts with like, a character A, and you can start playing with it. You can start like, changing the glyphs and making a serif bigger or smaller and just start playing with it. It's a really playful interface, and before you know it, you designed a font by accident. And you're like, whoa, that was weird. And you can export it and use it in Word right away. So I think like these kind of things that have more mature brothers ha can still be playful narrative interfaces. Photoshop is just lucky that if you do design, you have Photoshop. And they don't have to worry about being too easy. Any other cues? Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to ask if you have some examples of uh, narrative interfaces in bigger programs uh, for business enterprise. Oh, uh, I thought about this before I came. And I don't use a lot of them, so I, I wasn't very familiar with anything like that. The closest thing I have is Lighttable, which is a programming IDE uh, that does Lisp, Haskell. It does one of the functional languages. I can't remember which one. Um, it's really cool. These guys sat down and were like, OK, IDEs suck. How do we make them better? And they started from square one. And they built up a system of connected boxes, where each box is a different function, and they all go together. Um, and this is actually professional runtime. If you build applications that run major app, like major, on major servers to do major things. Uh, but it's a playful interface. And it's just like, OK, I have my first loop. And I, what I need? I need to process information. So I'm going to pop off a new function and make process information. And soon you build this graph visualization of an entire computer network that, at the end of the day, compiles back to like a big code file that goes into a compiler and sticks out the bytecode. But it's more playful interaction where you can start rearranging modules. So instead of having to like refactor by deleting parts of your code, moving it in the IDE, using the refactor tool, you just drag and drop blocks around. So it's more like writing a book on Post-it notes than writing a piece of programming. So I think they exist. But one of the problems with enterprise anything is that they're slow moving. So a lot of stuff we use today was established 15 years ago, and it's just following that sort of cycle. I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can brainstorm some afterwards. Uh, they must exist. And if not, Disruptive. Get in there. Awesome. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Okay. Wow. This is good. <laughs> this is good. This is filling up all my time. This is excellent. I would like to know what's your opinion on a multicultural interface design. Multi what we're meaning things that work maybe here in Western Europe or the US may not be interpreted the same way in Asia or Latin America. What was the term? Multi? Multi. I don't know. I, mean, I just made it up. Meaning that different cultures, maybe, because they read differently. Oh, they, yeah. They, they may. Oh, sorry. So, exactly. I mean, how do you know what, what you're designing is going to be interpreted oh, you know, in Japan or, or, or China? Or Affordances of different systems. Um, that's a very good question. Like, cultural differences are a big problem, especially now that a lot of stuff we create, especially apps on the web and in mobile, can literally go global, like they're global. Once you put it in the App Store, anyone with the App Store account can download it anywhere in the world. And because of that, we're seeing rifts in apps. Uh, like I can't remember what, there's an application in China which is basically WhatsApp, but it's the Chinese version. And just because it's Chinese and it does a couple things differently, it's just huge there. And WhatsApp's huge over here in the Western world. And they're basically the same thing. You're like, we'll just use the same thing. We can all communicate. But they don't, so it's weird. Uh, you got to build for your first markets. 
So one of the things that we do, when I, do, when I build things, I try to find the smallest group of people who want it, start with them, because it's always easier to go one up, right? Like I'd rather make 10 people happy that, they, that they're using my thing than make 1,000 people sort of non like they're OK with it. Like they're happy to exist, but they don't really want it. And like it's easier to get those 10 people happy, learn from that, and grow than to start by trying to attack everyone at once. Um, like one of the classic examples of this is like the difference between uh, like warning and OK lights between the U.S. and Russia back in like naval warfare. Like in Russia, like in the U like sort of the U.S. and in the U.K. like sort of this much in Europe, like green means go and red means stop. So we sort of associate with green with like OK system status and red is bad system status. But in Russia, it's like white and red. So it's like white is like everything's great and red is not so great. So it's this weird thing that green didn't mean anything. When a lot of like the Western software went over to Russia, they're like, what the fuck does green mean? Is it just means it's running? Is it good? Like, what's going on? So like these, these clashes happen all the time. Um, cultural language is important. Like a lot of what we do on the web is we're taking real world stuff and making it virtual, right? We're doing this as sort of skeuomorphic design, right? The fact that we have buttons on flat screens that we click, that there's no reason why it should be a button, right? But it looks like a button. It feels like a button because we're used to pushing buttons in real life. We do that all day long. Like when you're using your laptop, you're pushing buttons. So that translates, that language translates across barriers. Um, I don't know, look for commonalities. But to be honest, I always start with people who I know are going to love it and then figure out how we step from there instead of trying to tackle it all at once because then your head will explode from all these options. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are you using some uh, usability testing or eye tracking for, uh, for, for usability of uh, how, how people work with your websites yes. or applications? Yes, yes, yes. So one of the, the more recent things that I've been involved in that's been somewhat successful is uh, a company called List. Uh, List is a startup I founded with three, two other friends. Uh, we build e-commerce solutions for uh, fashion houses. We sell stuff online. It's not a very exciting company, but it's doing OK, so that's nice. Uh, but a big part of this is we were trying to build a better web shop for high fashion because what counts for a person shopping for a tomato online is very different than someone shopping for like a Balenciaga bag online. This idea of creating luxury on a web space is, is hard. So we did a lot of testing about what makes people activate and feel like they're in a luxury experience versus not. I'm a really big believer in usability testing. Uh, but when you go into testing, you have to understand what you're trying to test. A lot of people go into it and like, here's my app, use it. And everyone's like, what does it do? <laughs> like, OK. Uh, what is it? Oh, it's an app to monitor your baby. I don't have a baby. This doesn't mean anything to me. So one of the important things about usability testing is making sure you're talking to people who actually might care about what you're doing. There's a great, great book called uh, Rocket Surgery Made Easy. Yes. So Steve Krug kind of wrote the book on the practical way to user test. The one thing that book missed out on is choosing the right people. Um, Steve Krug is often, he works for a very blanket software company. So Things like Microsoft, where everyone's going to end up using it. So a nice broad range of people is a great testing bed. All the stuff that I build is very niche, so I have to look for the people I want. Um, finding that segment, finding that one person who is like your alternate user, and then getting them into user test is huge. And one of the most important things when usability testing that I have to always bang into all the people I work with is you're not allowed to say anything. You have to sit there and like in agony as you watch them just not click that button. You're like, all they have to do is click the send button and everything works, but they won't do it. But that's like good because obviously then your interface isn't explaining the fact that's what they need to do to move on. I think one of the, does anyone use Snapchat on your phone? Send all those lovely photos to each other? Um, Snapchat's just a photo sharing application. Uh, but one of the best things they've done in the recent updates is they changed their, because their send button was weird, right? Their send button originally was like a bunch of chevrons. And for me, that doesn't read as send, because I'm used to the send on the iPhone be that little arrow that goes like this. Right? That's always the export send icon. And so they broke the usability guidelines. So what they did to update it was they made it animated. They made it like a little back to the future, like boop, 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 animated Chevron. And I was like, oh, it means go. Of course, that's the send button. It's like that much easier. So I think like watching like where people are slipping and not saying anything, like the minute they don't click the send button, you're like, great, test over. I've learned something. I need to fix that. Because if you can't get them past step one, you're never going to get them to step 10 kind of thing. It's all about that narrative, getting them through that funnel of like getting them to that aha moment, that self-actualization of I've done something good. Any other questions, guys? 
All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, wait, a question. Last, All right. one, a question. last one, sorry. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, what's your view on the, the whole debate, uh, simplicity versus playfulness of debates? Because there is a huge debate between Oh, I don't think it's a debate. I think it's the same thing. I think there's different mechanics doing different things. Simplicity is allowing you to do one thing well, is sort of how I like to look at it. Like simplicity is cutting out all the fat, so the things you want people to accomplish is what they accomplish. Um, and playfulness, I think, is a way to help them get into that simplicity, right? They're not exclusive. I think they work really well together. Um, oh, I had such a good example at the top of my head. Um, bup, 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 bup. Hmm. I'll remember it later. It's going to kick me. But yeah, I don't think they're exclusive things. I think they work really well together. Playfulness is a way to make the experience just a little bit more than clicking buttons, right? It's a little bit happier than just scrolling through a form, right? There's simple things like um, Humble Indie Bundle is a great little startup. They do large game packages. So they, they package a bunch of indie games together, and you can buy them for whatever price you want. But one of the funny things they do is if you enter a price of zero, then like a sad developer pops up. And he's like, oh, I'm going to starve to death because you've got my games for free. And like, that doesn't seem like much, but it's playful. It's fun. You're like, oh, crap, I should probably give this guy money. And it helps the user navigate back towards a donation of like five bucks rather than zero. And so something, little things like that, it's still a simple interface of just choosing how much, put in a number, how much you want to pay. But there's playful objects around it that really accentuate what you want the person to do. Um, so often, like in startups, when you're building stuff, you're always like, get it done quick and fast. But if you have an idea that just makes it more of a wonderful experience, then I feel that's a worthwhile investment. Um, one of the product ideas I was working on a, a few months ago called Dexio, uh, I don't have internet, so I can't pull it up. But basically, it's just a site that lets you share slides with people. If you're a speaker, you can put your slides up, and people can like tweet out different decks. And so if you found this slide interesting, you could tweet it out very easily. Um, but the splash page took longer to make than the actual software, because it's like all this sort of SVG animation stuff going on. But because of that, people like sort of were like, oh, this is awesome. And they actually shared off that like wonderful animation, which got more people on the page and ended up in more conversions. So that sort of wonderful little playfulness actually helped us grow our community. So don't discount these sort of like side little almost gimmicky bits as bad things, because they actually might be the reason why people understand what's going on versus just being bored by a form. Probably what you should take away from this is like it's okay to do this fun stuff to help explain things. All right, guys, I'm actually out of time now, so thank you very much for listening to my talk. And I'll, I'll stand over there for a while if you want to come talk. <laughs>